Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship. You're all wearing red. <laughs> and the banners and uh, kind of kind of looks like a party or some kind of a celebration kind of a thing. Hmm. I wonder what that is. A birthday party or something like that. Well, I suppose in some ways you could say that. <laughs> this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in Oh, I've missed that. <laughs> I wanted to uh, make an announcement concerning the uh, little uh, worship cards, or little uh, prayer cards that we have in the, in the, fold, in the uh, booth here. And in front of you, if you have a prayer concern that you would like to include in the service, please write it down, and the ushers will collect that later on in the service. Let us worship together. As the wind song through the trees has the stirring of the breeze, so it is with the Spirit of God. Has the heart made strangely warm, has the voice within the storm, so it is with the Spirit of God. Never seen, never known Where this wind has blown Bringing life, bringing power to the world As the dancing tongues of fire As the soul's most deep desire So it is with the Spirit of God As the rainbow after rain has the hopes that born again, so it is with the Spirit of God. As the green in the spring has the kite on the string, so it is with the Spirit of God. Making worlds that are new, making peace come true, bringing gifts, bringing love to the world. As the rising of the east, as the wine at the feast, so it is with the Spirit of God. We began our worship this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the aid of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that, attentive to your word, we may confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent 
In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you and for all of us. And for his sake, God forgives you all of our, uh, forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We share together in our gathering hymn. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Lord be with you. And also with you. 
Let us pray. O oh God, on this day you open the hearts of your faithful people by sending us into your Holy Spirit. Direct us by the light of that Spirit that we may have a right judgment in all things and rejoice at all times in your peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If there are any prayer cards that are filled out, if you want to put them to the center aisle and hold them up, definitely we'll come and pick them up during the scriptures. The first reading is from Acts 2, starting with the first verse. 
Pentecost was a Jewish harvest festival that marked the 50th day after Passover. Luke portrays the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the disciples before the gathered and astonished people assembled in Jerusalem for the festival. Filled with the Spirit, the disciples were able to witness the power of Christ's resurrection. The reading begins. When the day of Pentecost had come, the apostles were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We will sing the song this morning. Um, I will sing the first part, and I ask that you sing the uh, bolded portion of each verse. Peter will play one time through. Mm -hmm. How manifold are your works, O Lord! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There go the ships to and fro. And Leviathan, which you made for the sport of it. You give it to them, they gather it. You open your hand, and they are filled with good things. Send forth your spirit, and they are created, and so ye renew the face of the earth. You look at the earth, and it trembles. You touch the mountains, and they smoke. May 
these words of mine. Please, God, I will rejoice in the Lord. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. Paul is helping the Corinthians understand the relationship between our God-given unity and spirit-created diversity. The spirit creates the unity of faith and gives all Christians diverse gifts for the common benefit of all. We need one another's diverse spiritual gifts because the same spirit has given them to each person for the common good. The reading begins. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And they are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of the one Spirit. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples were, had, were uh, where they had met, were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, then the disciples rejoiced and when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The Gospel of our Lord. Seated. It was a rainy day in February when Pastor John called and he said, Would you like to come and preach at Edison on Pentecost Sunday? And my response was, Would I? rainy and cold and bleak and gray and just a normal day in Seattle. <laughs> and here we are on this day. The sun is trying to shine and uh, the sunshine is certainly shining in all of your, your faces. It feels like old home week. God bless your hearts. Grace and peace from God our Creator our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ in the promise of the Holy Spirit. And we say, Amen. Well, as you just heard, the Bible tells us two different Pentecost stories. One more immediate 
and intimate, and the other more dramatic, 50 days following the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the latter that I want to focus on today. It's the one from Acts 1, the first lesson that uh, Darla read for us earlier. Darla, you get an A plus for the pronunciation. <laughs> everybody, I think everybody knows about now about reading the Pentecost from Act, the Pentecost lesson from Acts. It's a lector's nightmare. <laughs> well done. It must have been quite a party. Quite a party on that day, even before the Holy Spirit showed up. You see, Pentecost was a Jewish festival before it became a significant f festival and, and observance for Christians. Pentecost means 50, and it comes 50 days after the Jewish celebration of the Passover, which you may remember happens on Easter weekend. 50 days after Easter. And it was a, f a festival where God's people, uh, God's people came to remember God's giving of the Ten Commandments, the Law, the Torah. Remember that event uh, from Mount Sinai? Many Jews would have come from many different nations and places, and Darla reminded of those strange-sounding places, areas that now we would call African, we would now call Roman, Greece, Turkey, Near East, even places in Arabia. Three different continents. Three different continents that came together. And, and they were invited to come to Jerusalem for a celebration of Pentecost. They came in different dress. They came with different customs. They came with different foods packed away for the trip. They came with speaking different languages from the places they came. It must have been quite a sight in old Jerusalem, that Pentecost. Probably not all that much different from what happens today when folks walk the streets of old Jerusalem. You bump into each other. It's a, it's a crowd moving through those crooked and, and inclined streets of old Jerusalem. And somewhere in the city, the, G, uh, the uh, disciples of Jesus were continue, continuing to be obedient to his command, to his request to them of waiting and watching and praying, as Jesus told them, for the promised spirit to come. <sighs> you were here last Sunday. I uh, watched from afar. That's the benefit of, I guess, the pandemic. You can come watch things from afar nowadays. And I understand uh, you had a celebration. I saw the celebration of the choir. Uh, it was also the, the uh, seventh Sunday in Easter. I remember I watched it on my iPad. Kathy Smith read the account from the first chapter of, of Acts. Today we read the uh, second chapter. Jesus had told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem, and they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And today you hear what happened. It was forecasted last week. You hear it today, what happened. First, the sound of a rushing and violent wind, it was said. Tongues of, as of fire were resting upon the disciples. And then all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. What was the evidence? Luke, in his writing of Acts, tells us, as, he, as they began to speak those languages of the Spirit, that is the evidence of the, of the coming of the Spirit. The Spirit gave them the ability, these, these, uh, these common uh, disciples from uh, Galilee. Even more surprising, however, was that their voices carried out of that upper room into the streets below so that many in the crowd who were mingling below heard, heard the disciples speaking in their native tongues. So no matter where they came from, they heard the gospel in their own language, spoken by these Galileans. Most of them, had, uh, most of them who heard were amazed and perplexed and asked the appropriate question, at least for Lutherans, what does this mean? But some sneered and said, well, he probably went to the bar before breakfast. 
I have a couple of relatives that know what that means. <laughs> what does this mean? What does this mean? This question before us is the question that is now asked on this particular Pentecost Sunday. What does this mean that a bunch of minimal, minimally educated Galileans, rural people, and so they, they can suddenly communicate with strangers from all over the place about God's love revealed to us in the grace and in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. I want to assert this morning for you that the Pentecost story means that God loves humanity. God loves us so much in our diversity and that God can and will make a diverse creation with all of its differences into a blessing for all of life. Now, one way that the Pentecost story is typically interpreted is that it was a reversal of the Tower of Babel story. Remember that? Some of you may remember that from the Sunday school days. It's found in Genesis 11, the very first book of the Old, Old Testament. At the beginning of the Bible, it comes after Noah and the flood. Humanity is growing in numbers, it's to, it's, it's, it is told, and they have accumulated some ascents and had gotten back on their feet following the flood. And as the account reads, everyone speaks the same language. Well, the people came, uh, come to a certain place and they decide, hey, this is a good place. And they decide to build a great city with large walls and a huge tower because they had been afraid of the wideness of God's mercy and God's creation. And they had the fear of losing what they had acquired. So they erect walls and a huge tower instead of multiplying blessing all over the face of God's earth, which was the call of God to them. It's an old, old, old story, but I suspect it's really not all that old. God is alarmed at what God sees, and God has a strategy. God decides to confuse their languages so they don't communicate so well anymore. God, God does this, and, but they remain stuck in that city, and then, and, then, and then eventually they forget about the city and, and the tower, and they go on their separate ways, and once again become scattered all over the face of the earth. Now, the Pentecost story has been interpreted often as a reversal of this curse, of a, of, of a curse of this judgment of God. God pours out the Holy Spirit and the Christian church is born and a diverse crowd becomes one again. But that's not how the story goes. Jesus' followers do not speak a single language that everyone understands, nor do they speak some divine language that only the faithful people can understand. What happens? The Holy Spirit somehow empowers those simple disciples to speak all of the languages that were spoken from those foreign visitors in Jerusalem at the time. God makes God's intentions, I believe, very clear. It's not that we should all adopt, all of us adopt a Christian culture or one set of traditions or one language. God keeps our diversity intact, and the promised Spirit communicates the good news of Jesus Christ to all. God's grace and forgiveness to all. At Pentecost, God shows us how God comes to us in all of our differences to communicate the same good news. Good news for everyone. Rather than reversing the curse of Babel, Pentecost reinforces what happens in, in Genesis 11. Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann says that the scattering in the Tower of Babel story was not a curse at all. It was ascending forth once again, ascending forth to discover the wideness of God's promises. Humanity gets stuck in one place, turned in on themselves, if you will, 
They become worried about making a name for themselves when God instead wants them to continue to scatter over this planet and fill, fill the planet, fill the world, fill creation with God's blessings. God's people then inter are interrupted, then inter are interpreted in the story as it's a story of judgment because it upset the status quo. That still happens. So what do the events of that first Pentecost mean? What does this mean? Well, it means for each of us that God is able to speak and to understand our language. And I'm not just talking about English or Norwegian or Spanish or German or even Swahili. It means that no matter how clear or how falteringly you know, our, our attempts to talk about God are, they get through. They get through. God understands. Whatever the particular dialect of our experiences are, God gets it. I've been noticing that enticing commercial these last few months. Have you seen it? Jesus gets us. It's flashed across the screen at the last. And yet it's more than just a play on words. It's more than just a pithy evangelism ploy. No matter how confusing our speech might be, we don't need to learn how to use an elevated church talk. My kids used to call it church ease. Dad, are we going to hear church ease today? We don't need what some might call holy speech to communicate God to God, to God and God with us. The promised Holy Spirit that Jesus gives translates just fine. Thank you very much. The Pentecost story teaches us what a Pentecostal church looks like. Now, now by a Pentecostal church, I don't mean the kind of church that we usually associate with being a Pentecostal, one that speaks in tongues at worship. A Pentecostal church is one where everyone does not speak the same language. Notice that the Spirit is not only poured out on those who come from different places, who speak different languages, but when Peter preaches that sermon in our text from, and quotes the Old Testament prophet Joel, he talks about a Spirit that is poured out on sons and daughters, a Spirit that crosses gender lines, the young and the old, Men and women shall dream dreams, and old men and women shall see visions, or even economic classes. He talks about the slaves will receive the Holy Spirit. Truth is, we who are in these different groups don't necessarily speak the same language. Have you noticed that? <laughs> Dad? Dad? What do you mean when you say, son, run that past me again? Do you, have you noticed that? Have you noticed those things? A Pentecostal church will open its, do its doors and its people will open their arms wide to seek, the sh to seek and to share the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus, Jesus Christ with all kinds of people. And not necessarily require them to come to us or even be like us. If we are a spirit-led church, I suppose the first thing we need to ask is, what is church? What is church? I seem to remember preaching a number of times when I was here as your interim here at Edison about the New Testament understanding of the, understanding of the word. The Greek word ekklesia. Ekklesia. Translated, the called out ones. So, not a building, not a steeple. Open the door of your mind. It's the people. The church goes where we go. And we have been called and we have, the good, we have good news to share. And it's all about the forgiveness of God in Jesus Christ. 
we are equipped, you and I, all of us together as the one church. We are equipped with all that we need, with a word that we can trust. We have been equipped with the word of the forgiveness of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Lord forgives our sins, my sins and yours. The same Peter who preached the sermon from the text that we have before us in Acts also preached a sermon later in his uh, letter, first letter of Peter. And he says this, as you, who? You. As you come to him in the li- uh, come to him the living stone, the living stone, you also. And that living stone was rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. But you also are living stones to be built into a spiritual house and to be a holy priesthood. That's where Luther got his priesthood of all believers. And give those sacrifices of worship to him through Jesus Christ. It's about the priesthood of all all believers. It's about the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. What is required of us? Come on, pastor, tell us what to do. Well, in some ways, as a pastor, I want to, I want to say this. Nothing. I seem to remember preaching a number of times where I was referring to you, the, the uh, Luther's explanation to the third article of the Creed. I believe that by my own understanding or strength, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ or come to him. But instead, the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with the, gospel, with the uh, Spirit's gifts, made me holy and kept me in the true faith, just as he calls, gathers, enlightens, and makes the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it united with Jesus in one common and true faith. And then he puts in a word. Daily. Not Sunday. Daily. In this Christian church. The Holy Spirit forgives all sins. Mine and those of all believers. On the last day the Holy Spirit will raise me and all the dead and will give to me and all believers in Christ eternal life. This is most certainly true. What is required of us? And as a pastor, I would also want to say everything. But mark it as a joyous everything. Not dependent on earning or working or doing, but trusting in the free forgiveness of sins found in the grace and and mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We have been entrusted, you and I, we've been entrusted with a gift to give away. That's what it's all about. That's what Pentecost is all about. I have been vividly reminded of that this last year. I've lost two dear friends who knew the joy of everything. I visited here... I visited a dear old friend who happened to be a pastor who was in frail conditions and had the ravages of many different things, many health-related events and diseases happening in his life. And as I sat with him alone in a hospital room, I visited with him and we reminisced about it. We had a lot of catching up to do. We had a lot of reminiscing to do. And then I decided that we would read a couple of cherished Bible passages, which I I did, I did, and we both knew those so well we could almost say them by heart. He paused then as we were talking about those things, and he said these words, Al, I need to hear. I need to hear the words again. I need to hear the words again. And through my misty eyes, the humble words that I shared with you earlier in this service, as a called and ordained pastor of the Church of Christ and by his authority. 
I declare to you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. And as you probably imagine, Pastor Al, with a shaky hand, I made the sign of the cross and traced it on the forehead of my dear friend's head on his, in, in that bed. My brother in Christ. My other friend shared his own forgiveness sin story. <laughs> he was traveling on an airplane, caught up in a conversation with a Vietnam returning home veteran. My friend had been, my friend who was, the, uh, I believe, the keenest of listeners, a keen ear for listening, began to just simply listen and not talk, listen and not talk as the young man just began pouring out his story. And one story led to another story, led to another story, and soon it became a confession of sorts of all those things he had done and left undone in Vietnam and the burdens that still haunted him. And my dear friend, as the plane began its descent into the airport at Minneapolis, struggled to unloosen his seat belt, much to the much much to the angst of the of the flight instructor, uh, flight attendants who said, "Buck up, buckle up, please. We're now landing." For him, he wasn't landing; he was standing up. And he placed his hands on on this young man's forehead. And he said as he raised his hand to place it on the young, young man's head, as a called and ordained pastor of the Church of Jesus Christ, I declare to you, to you, the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. My friend, my friend, friend knew that that's the gift that we are called to share, that that is the gift that we are called to share. My friend raised that hand and gave the absolution. And so my word to you, fellow pastors in Christ, priesthood of all believers, be the church. Be the church in Christ, in and out of this place. Give the gift you have. Give the gift that you have, been, uh, that you have received away. And remind others what this airplane friend of mine used to say so joyously. Listen to these words. <laughs> we are the ones done unto. We are the ones done unto by Almighty God in Jesus Christ, who has come into the world to save sinners, not to assist those who are working on all things by themselves. Be the church. And cherish the spoken words of Jesus given to you to share with others the forgiveness of sins that is found in Jesus Christ always and in all places. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we all pray. Amen.
Let us confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. United in the hope and joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Passionate God, you send your spirit through the gifts of fire, wind, and word. As you equip the disciples for their work, equip us to bring the good news to all those who long for you. Hear us, O oh God. Ever-present God, your spirit embraces all. Send your spirit of understanding to immigrants, refugees, and anyone experiencing language barriers. Bless the work of translators, teachers, ambassadors, and international peace organizations. Safely guide those fleeing war and danger. Hear us, O God. Merciful God, you anoint us with your spirit. Bless nurses, doctors, midwives, chaplains, counselors, and hospice workers as they care for those in need. We pray for all who seek your comfort. Hear us, O God. Life-giving God, we give thanks for those who have died to new life in you. As we observe Memorial Day, we remember those who died in military service, comfort all who mourn, and usher in a world where war is no more. Hear us, O God. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Receive these concerns which we now name before you. We pray for Gold Star families. We pray for families and friends of Vern Sorensen, whose celebration of life is today. We pray for the people of Ukraine and the people of Somalia. Hear us, O God. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. You may share that peace with one another.
So, uh, I know she is. Uh, we will receive the morning's offering. Let us pray. God of mercy and grace, the eyes of all wait upon you, and you open your hand in blessing. Fill us with good things at your table, that we may come to the help of all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and, and our duty and our delight that we should give thanks at all times and places. Give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, fulfilling the promise of the resurrection, you poured out your fire upon your fire of the Spirit upon all, uniting one body of people, every nation, every tongue. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all of the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn.
in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He gave it to all his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant, the new promise in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Pray in our Lord's Prayer as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We invite you to come to um, the Lord's table. A uh, reminder, uh, when you come to the Lord's table, um, the one, uh, you may be seated, the one chalice will have wine, the other chalice will have grape juice. If you need a gluten-free um, piece of bread, please make that um, indication, indication to us. Also, if you also, if you want the grape juice, hold your cup your hand over your cup when the wine is poured. All is ready, you are invited.
Many things have changed. Those who are, are communing in the pews, if you would take your uh, pew kit or the communion kit in hand, please take the bread first and take that and do that now. I can't see everyone, but uh, I'm assuming that you're following my able directions. <laughs> and now, if you would take the blood, the wine, and receive the blessing. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and give you peace for service. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I think we're going to move to the announcements in your worship folder. And uh, what's going on around here? Yeah. Must be important. It is important. Yeah, it's important. <laughs> so, greetings. Um, so, I'd like to give a special shout out to Peter for his organization around the Lutherwood yeah. Dining Hall deck. <laughs> he has put. Yeah. So, I was going to say there was a few of us up there working yesterday and a few from other churches, and we've accomplished the the uh, underpinnings and the first few layers. And um, I'm just up here to say, again, how grateful I am for all the contributions, but we have about $1,500. We, we had some contributions come in the last time I made an announcement. We have about $1,500 that uh, Peter has into this for decking that we're going to try and reimburse him for as a congregation. 
It's sort of been a special project of our congregation, and it's a critical area for um, the kids to gather as they leave the dining hall and look out over the lake, and it was just in such bad repair, we couldn't let it go another, another year. And so Peter and I uh, and a bunch of others tore into that last, last time, and there's no point of return, so no going back. But it's looking good. We're going to finish it in this next week or so. So if anyone has anything to contribute, uh, please, uh, we'll put it under a special Lutherwood. Um, if, you ha- if you want to give me um, those contributions, I'll put it in an envelope, put it under Lutherwood deck, mm-hmm. and we'll um, file it with the office, and it will be there to reimburse <laughs> Peter. And uh, we'll just see if we can't get this done, all right? Thanks. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Always an important announcement, gratitude uh, expressed is an important thing. Um, Pastor John is, uh, is going to come home flying high. He's up at Holden Village with some of the youth from our congregation. I think that's the first time he's been able to enjoy that place. If anyone has been to Holden, you know the beauty and the serenity and the power of that place found in the people the people who are the Church of God. Um, any other announcements? Yeah, Larry. Um, I don't want to go to the microphone right now, but I, in keeping with gratitude, mm-hmm. I wanted to express my appreciation for Larry and some of what Peter yep. arranged and wrote today. Mm-hmm. Thank, you. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> Always. Any other announcements that should be shared this time? Well, I know we're going to have some fun at fellowship. Uh, I'd be really disappointed if we didn't. (laughs) Uh, I've been talking about that fellowship time in every interim I've served, and I've served in seven interims. Holy mackerel. Um, You are a beautiful people. Thank you for this time together. Uh, God bless you in our time together. I don't have a bulletin. Where are we? Is it a (laughs) a, a closing hymn? Have the people come forward for the... No, no, the people are not coming forward. Yeah. I was, I was told right. okay. uh, they're prepared without me. <laughs> and so I've got uh, the sending. Actually, it's a sending kind of referring to that uh, Pentecost message. <sighs> the peace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Keep your minds and your hearts in Christ Jesus. We pray. Amen. Amen. Our sending him, Lord, you give the great commission. Let's sing verses one and five. One and five. Go in peace, serve the risen Christ.